Welcome back, pet parents. Today's episode is such a treat. So if you remember back to the Ninja Groomer episode with Kat Henshin, she, first of all, if you have not listened to that episode, please go back and listen to it because she blew my mind on, on a lot of like preconceptions that I had about grooming and groomers. So please go back and listen to that episode. But I'm so excited because her wonderful husband has decided to join us as well. And if you are not familiar with BC, well, you should be because he knows like everything there is to know about the pet food industry. He's been an advocate. Uh, he's uh, for independent uh, sales of pet food stores sell selling pet foods. He has blogged for over 10 years on the pet food industry. And I I'm just going to let him take this episode away, really, because he has so much knowledge and information that I think is beneficial to all of us as consumers, because we're putting this food in our pet's mouths and we are so disconnected from the process. Also, the fact that he was an advocate for independent pet stores, that's really the first place that people, like the first line of defense in getting information and education out to consumers. So I'm so excited for you to be here. Thank you for joining me, BC. Of course. Anytime. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be speaking with you. We certainly had fun together in uh, Las Vegas with Super Zoo, the world's largest pet industry trade show. So it's always good to see people and reconnect. It is. And so much fun with uh, Jay and Adrian, the two crazy cat ladies. They always throw the most epic party. <laughs> but uh, it was so, so good to actually meet you and Kat in person. Um, but I, I can you just, I don't know, let's start from the start. What got you interested in the pet food industry? So the origin story, which not a ton of people know I was actually doing other work. I was in the industry, construction industry, but I was a dog trainer at heart. So I had a German Shepherd that I trained. He was kind of my sole dog. And I went to a training facility and actually apprenticed there. And that was kind of the punitive days of doing, um, choker chains and those types of things that we, we don't do nowadays or most of us don't do. So I was heavy into dog training and I actually got a job at PetSmart as a dog trainer. So when I discovered these more compassionate based training, I knew I needed structure. I needed somebody to instruct. I needed kind of a, a program to go through. And at that time, I mean, we're talking almost 20 years ago, PetSmart was doing compassionate dog training. They did not allow choker chains in their uh, classes. They didn't allow pincher collars. So I went there to learn more because there weren't a lot of private trainers that were doing the compassionate-based training. Well, in working there, I started to learn about pet foods because people would ask me questions you're the dog trainer, so you must know everything, which is obviously ridiculous. But I picked up a, a magazine called um, The Whole Dog Journal, which was a quarterly magazine. In fact, it, it still may be. It's um, Nancy Kearns, and she's a wonderful soul. And in there, she had the top 10 pet foods that she would recommend. And her criteria was way more giving than what I do nowadays, but it was a start. And I noticed none of those pet foods were in PetSmart. So the top 10 brands were all in independent pet stores. So I actually went to an independent pet store and started learning from that person about pet foods. And I actually ended up making a deal to buy a pallet of a brand of dog food that was on the whole dog journal list. And I sold it. Now people would say, you sold it to people at PetSmart, they should have you know, fired you instantly. And number one, they did eventually fire me. But number two, I wasn't selling to customers. I was selling to the other employees. So again, you have a whole employee base. They're working at PetSmart because they love their pets mm -hmm. and they get fed this data 
being an employee of PetSmart, that is definitely one sided. Um, you know, so you're you're learning from sales reps and you're learning from the company itself. And at that point, I started selling to those that were interested just out of the trunk of my car. And that got me down the road. And at that time, my wife was starting a grooming salon. She had just graduated out of grooming college. And I said, you know, I want to sell food out of there. So it took a while. She ended up grooming by herself for several months before we could afford to make the jump. But that's how it all started. And then as I got better and better, like I said, Whole Dog Journal, great stepping stone. But, you know, she really didn't dive deep into the manufacturing. In fact, I found out very little people were doing the actual manufacturing side. Everybody wants to look at ingredient panels. Everybody wants to look at the GAs. Well, you can have a label that looks great that's made in a horrible, horrible facility, and I would never feed that. You can have a food that looks great on paper, and if it was made anyplace else, it would be the number one pet food. But because it's made in a horrible, horrible facility, I take that off the list. So then I really got into manufacturing, which led me to AFCO, because AFCO in the U.S. is certainly, we have to be careful because they do not govern pet food. AFCO is a independent association that feed control officials, the states, join. And the goal is to try and get everybody's rules all on the same page. But AFCO doesn't test pet food. They don't give rules, reference pet food. It's the states that are members that make the rules, and then AFCO puts it into a publication and charges you for that because they're a private entity. So that got me into AFCO, which opened up more of my eyes about how horrible this pet food industry is. And at the same time, I was also passionate about micro-independent pet stores because, like you said, that's where it all starts. You're not going to find the next groundbreaking food at PetSmart or Petco or any of those big boxes. You're going to find the groundbreakers in the micro independent stores, the mom and pops that are passionate about the foods and have researched it and decided to sell it. I, I talked about it in one of my articles recently. Nobody ever walked in my store and asked for goat's milk. Nobody ever said, you know what, you should sell goat's milk. It was a manufacturer who came to us and said, you know what, we got goat's milk for pets. Here's what it does, how it works, and you need to sell it. And again, the micro independent said, absolutely, that's genius. Why didn't we think of it? And the big box stores said, yeah, that's ridiculous. Nobody's ever going to go through that and get freezers and all that. And here we are 15 years later, and everybody has a goat's milk. Hey, I think Walmart has a goat's milk at this point. So that kind of led me down that world. So, you know, my passion is not trying to get people to feed the best food in the world. My passion is trying to get people to feed the best they can afford and understand what they're feeding. I don't care if you're buying your food from Walmart. If that's all you can do, that dog's probably happy. Can we do better? Can we thrive? Well, maybe not on your price point, but I can give you some cheap freebies, as you've done multiple times on your channel, of things to add to the bowl that's going to increase that dog's nutrition tenfold. You know, something simple like sardines, or which you can get anywhere. You can get in Walmart, you can get them in oil, rinse them off, feed sardines. Steve Brown, one of the best food uh, formulators out there, he, he was cornered by our friend Rodney, who said, if you could just do one thing to a food bowl, what would you do? And Steve Brown said, I would add sardines. Yeah, they're an incredible source of nutrition and healthy fats, which we're definitely not getting from a kibble, kibble diet. <laughs> Feed the brain, right? Um, that is so, so interesting, all of that. And I had no idea that you were a dog trainer. I actually started out as a dog trainer. 
And I can't do I can't do it. I can't do it. I love, 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 love working with dogs and seeing that like that bond that forms when you're, you know, because tr- I, I, I do positive reinforcement. So that bond that forms is it's it's beautiful. There's nothing like it. But the dog trainer world is horrendous. I don't know if you've kept up with it at all, but I can't do it. Cannot do it. So um, it's just not for me. I'm too thin-skinned, I guess. <laughs> it is a different world. And I, when you have the opportunity to work with people that really train dogs compassionately still, then you come out there and you think, I'm not a dog trainer. I, I'm a joke. I mean, you see some of these people that are really, their dogs are just on it. They're looking. You can tell they're happy doing what they do. It's incredible. I There is absolutely nothing better than a well-trained dog, though. And you want to help dogs across the world, teach your dog some basic lessons. You know, we want to avoid using things like manners. And um, there's actually, you know, obedience is now becoming a bad word and all that. But still, you have a dog that just... You know, if the UPS man walks up and you can say down, stay and deal with him and not worry about your dog and he's not jumping up and trying to knock down the UPS man, those are those positive in, um, reactions that make people want to have pets and train pets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it is a beautiful thing to see when it when it's done right, at least the so the the independent pet stores and I know, you know, with the it used used to be platinum paws that y'all had and and um just as things have progressed in life i know that the ninja groomer build is going on which is not probably not going to be to the same scale as as platinum paws but you were selling selling foods in platinum paws so that was kind of your how how you got into um deciding what food what foods to bring into the store and what you would like to feed your own dogs i imagine that's how i I have a a friend who owns an independent pet store here and where i live and um i mean like you were saying the amount of research that goes into a decision to bring a product into the store and to remove a product from the store because a lot of times to bring a product in you you have to make shelf space. So you might have to decide to let something go from the store as well. Like that is intense. And I don't think a lot of people uh, think about what you go through as an independent retailer trying to make these decisions. So what were, or what are some of the things that you consider? Because obviously you have um, a really big passion for the actual manufacturing side, which I think those of us, at least in the healthy pet space, are starting to get more involved in. Like we're seeing companies like Green Juju and Viva Raw that are just look at our facility. Like we're going to post videos all the time of what is going on in our facilities, right? Which I love. I want to see that. So before social media, how are you doing this? (laughs) Yeah. And so micro independence are the key to everything. And you, and you touched on something that I want to just let your followers and listeners think about. The hardest decision for a micro independent pet store owner is to make the decision to pull something off their shelves. So in my case, my devil knocking at the door was the original Evo which was the first grain free really and it did things different um they had a different manufacturing facility they had a different philosophy they were about high protein high fat nobody ever do that i mean the vets were like you can't do that that's high fat you'll destroy that dog and they did it and they did it well and they showed it now Have we improved on their formulas and and what they started out with? Absolutely. But to get where I was going, that was the number one kibble 
in my store. And at that time we had very little raw. So uh, that was my number one food. I sold that every day, hand over fist. It was a boutique type food. So it wasn't found hardly anywhere. And in the being a smaller company, it controlled the space. So even if somebody opened up another small pet store across the street, they wouldn't sell Evo to them because they wanted to be loyal to me. So things were a lot different back then, but they sold. And they sold ultimately to Procter & Gamble. And Procter & Gamble at that time did not have a good history with pet food. And I threw all my product out on the curb and actually donated it to a humane society. That was some sleepless nights. You know, how are we going to survive? I mean, that was our number one seller. What are people going to do? Are they going to go find another store that still sells that? Or are they going to believe me and make a jump to the new foods that I have? And I was lucky enough to weather that storm. And we did a lot of kind of inside baseball where my new foods, I would give a free bag to anybody looking for the old food. I just gave you a free bag and it wasn't a trial bag. It was a full size bag, 28 pounds, whatever at the time. And then the manufacturer that was getting Evo space, you know, they credited me. So I was able to kind of come out. Okay. Did I lose money? Absolutely. There are some consumers that were like, Evo's the best food in the world. You've been saying that for years. And just because Procter and Gamble bought it doesn't mean that it's junk. And they could have been right. Um, but ultimately, they ended up having recalls. And California Natural, um, Natura, um, all of it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. Procter & Gamble sold it, and then the company that bought it killed it. It doesn't exist. So, you know, that's what you got to think about. But for a micro-independent, if I decide to take something that's my top seller and not sell it anymore, That's something consumers should pay attention to. And the only way that you're going to really get that is by shopping at independent stores and keeping up on them. The One of the inside baseball that we talk about, and I'm sure you have on this channel, cut your labels. The very first bag of Evo, well, that label was not the same a year later, two years later, five years later. They don't have to disclose they just have to make the label right. So they don't have to say, oh, you know what? We've, we're not using that many eggs anymore. So it's now in the fourth position instead of the third position. They don't have to do any type of announcement on that. They just have to change the label. So you know, keep track of how those foods are changing microscopically. And that's one way that you can keep up on a brand, what's going on with it. Uh, but again, Micro independents will do this because they have the passion. And we talk about selling my store. You know, it was a tough decision. We're getting older. I have some health issues, blah, blah, blah. I won't get into that. But the people that bought my store are great people, but they don't have the same passion that I do. They aren't going to throw a food out on the curb because, you know, they've made an investment in the business. They have loans. They have things going on. I don't fault them, but that second owner doesn't have the same passion as the first owner. And it's actually the same in pet food. So when you see somebody like Rademacher sell to Procter & Gamble, well, Rademacher, he cared. He cared about every bag that he sold. And if there was a recall or a safety issue or something wrong, it hurt him as a manufacturer. Procter & Gamble, that's not what they do. There's too many people. You got board of directors to deal with. So you lose that passion. Now, I'm not saying there aren't good foods that are made by the big companies, but overall safest bet is feed the smallest manufacturer that you can afford. And usually you'll be okay. And we've seen that a lot in raw, you know, a ton of these. So 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I would do seminars like this in person. You ask how I got my word out. We did a lot of pet events, did a lot of things 
I was on local media. They would have, you know, oh, BC will bring in a poodle. And so they had me on once a month talking about pet food. But I would say anything you buy out of the refrigerator is great for your dog. So that was the micro independence. They had, you know, probably nature's variety. They probably had answers. They probably had some of those. And it didn't matter. If you were buying out of the freezer, because that was such a small segment, you were safe. Well, here we are 15, 20 years later, there's a whole lot in the freezer that I would never feed my pet. And it's again, because the bigger companies say, hey, there's 10% of the industry that we're not reaching. So let's come out with a real food, rather it be frozen or gently cooked or whatever. So now you do have to be more diligent. So Again, just like looking at your shelf, if you're looking in that freezer, you see green juju. Green juju is what? Three people? Four people, I think? Yeah. I mean, that's a small company and you're safe with them. Um, you know, Answers used to be a really good brand and it's gone through some changes and that passion was lost. I wouldn't personally feed Answers right now, but I'm not saying it's wrong if people do. But for me, there were some other issues. But they were a small company. Uh, you know, Nature's Variety, where a lot of the food started, they weren't necessarily the smallest company, but they were pretty small when you're talking about um, the size of these manufacturers. So once again, your safest bet as a consumer is keep your ear on people like you and the other bloggers and the micro-independent pet channels because those are the guys who are really putting the feet to the fire on these manufacturers. Oh, there was so much in there that I want <laughs> to expand on. <laughs> um, and I actually, there's a, a lady who owns an independent pet store in Williamsburg, Virginia that I had the pleasure of meeting last year. And now she's a, she's a friend. She was telling me a very similar story that she had, it was her best selling kibble and a huge percentage of her customer base came in just for that kibble. And it was, she didn't feel right selling it. Something happened. She didn't feel right selling it anymore. She pulled it and it was, she was just like, it was like all heck broke loose, right? Like her customer, there, she had a certain percentage of customers who were like, I'm never shopping here again. And, you know, but as, and, and if, you know, we think of, even this the smallest business they they have to make money to stay alive but at the same time you don't want to compromise your morals and ethics and if you don't feel right about something you know you you just can't do it you you can't do it and hopefully you have a good enough relationship with your customers that you can explain to them why you made this decision and that ultimately you made it for the welfare of their pets and, you know, hopefully they, they stick with you. But, um, yeah, that has to be really, really difficult, especially if it is, like you were saying, your number one bestseller, um, hands down, probably keeping keeping the lights on. <laughs> yes. Um, so in these manufacturing practices, you you just talked about something where you have this passion from somebody who is starting a company and you're really com you feel really comfortable be with not only buying their product but offering it for sale to other people to give their pets and then they sell the company and when they sell the company regardless of who they sell it to as you were just saying like the, that same passion isn't necessarily going to be there but when they sell to big corporations i'm curious what your thoughts are on this today because it's not inherently a bad thing, like you were saying, to sell to a big corporation. But when we have, especially companies that built their reputation on quality control and, I, you know, this is, everything is hand selected and picked and put together. We formulated this to be XYZ because it, whether it's a food or a supplement or whatever it is. And then they do sell to a big corporation like 
a supplement company just recently sold to General Mills. And it's like, okay, maybe nothing's going to change right away. And like you were saying, we're seeing this trend where these big conglomerate companies are seeing even a small percentage in the space that they're losing to the healthy pet food side or the healthy supplement side, and they want a part of it. So they do buy up these smaller companies. That's just how the world works. And they may not change anything right away, but eventually there is a good possibility that something's going to change because as you said, it's not about, it's not always about the quality of the product. It's about every, every quarter that profit margin has to go up for the, that board or somebody, some, somebody's getting hell, right? <laughs> so what are your thoughts on, on that aspect of what's going on now and, and how they are buying up a lot of the smaller companies that we have trusted for so long? Again, it uh, comes down to what happens with these bigger companies is they buy the small company that has a great following. You know, usually they might not have the best of sales, but the company, the bigger company says, you know what, with our, our force, we're going to be able to buy cheaper. We're going to be able to manufacture smarter. We're going to be able to do this and that better. And ultimately... The, the problem is, like you said, it's the fund managers and the, the board members because pet, the pet industry grows every year. I mean, you know, 10% more than last year, that type of stuff. So they go in, they go, you know what? We bought BC's Pet Food and we've been flat. We haven't made a dime. And they go, well... He's already using the best ingredients you can get. He's already manufacturing the best location. I don't know that we can do a price increase. That would be our option. Well, then somebody goes, now, wait a minute. Why can't we use a different grade of chicken? Why can't we do it this way? And when you don't have that passion, when you don't have somebody like me sitting there or you or somebody that just lives and breathes by this, those arguments get hard. So, you know, we want to use a different chicken. It, it's the same grade, but it comes from a different place. Well, we don't want to do that because we don't trust that place. Well, we do. So that's how we're buying our chicken from now on. And then they've just saved, you know, a penny a bag. And that equates to 3% in, at the end of the year. So that's kind of how it happens. Uh, again, to go back, I threw all of Natura Foods out on the sidewalk when they were bought by Procter & Gamble. I was actually flown to the Natura plant in Nebraska by Procter & Gamble. So they heard what I did and they called me up and, and it was the vice president who is still a great friend of mine. I love him dearly. And he said, you know what? We haven't changed anything and we're gonna prove it. You're gonna get on a flight. You can go anywhere you want. You can talk to any employee and they're going to tell you we haven't changed anything. And I said, okay, you know, hey, free free plant trip. So I went there and uh, my dogs are barking. So if you need me to stop okay. for a minute, to get to the door. We're so, all pet parents. <laughs> well, that means their mom's home. Um, but... I went to that plant and I did exactly what they said, man. I, I asked everybody and they're like, yeah, no, nothing's really changed, blah, blah, blah. And I came to the warehouse and they were moving food out. And I said, don't you guys test and hold? I said, no, we did away with test and hold. So for those that don't know, the smaller manufacturers will make a batch of food, whatever it be, 15,000 pounds, whatever. And then they send that out for testing. So they're testing for the GA stuff that we all know, the fat, the protein, blah, blah, blah. But they're also testing for negative um, bacteria, all the bad things. And they're testing a lot of other things. There's a lot that goes into the manufacturer's test. Well, the bigger companies don't necessarily do test and hold because they believe in their kill steps. So smaller companies don't use the same kill steps. But 
that was the change. So I was in Natura and they said, we don't do test and hold anymore. We don't need to. We have a proprietary Procter & Gamble product that is our kill step. Nothing will get by that kill step. And I said, okay, that's interesting. You know, are you killing a lot of the good with that? And they were like, no, studies show we're not hardly affecting it. Well, I got back home and I was impressed by the tour and I actually brought in some of their food again. And lo and behold, a recall comes out. Procter and Gamble issues a recall for salmonella. And I called up this vice president. I said, that's impossible. You told me the kill step kills everything. And at that time, it was the day of, he had no idea what happened. So they ended up investigating it. And what occurred with that was they took some employees off of the finished product line. Check that. They took some employees off of the raw ingredients line because they were shorthanded on the finished product. And those employees didn't necessarily all disinfect like they should have. So they brought some salmonella from the raw materials over to the finished products. So it bypassed their kill step because the kill step had already been done. But these guys are handling bags, packaging bags, throwing them on a pile. They got salmonella on their hands. They don't even know it. That's how the recall happened. So, again, is it a good is it a better food because Procter & Gamble bought it? Is it a worse food because of the kill step? I mean, that, that stuff can get you crazy. But for me, I really like test and hold. I like manufacturers that do test and hold. So um, I actually stopped carrying that brand again. And, you know, we parted ways. But I still see my buddy who is now in another pet food company. But, um, you know, it was eye-opening for me. So that was kind of when we're talking about manufacturing and why you want to know where it's made, you know, in 2007, the biggest pet food recall of history, um, when it was the contaminated cat cans, if you remember that, we had people that were feeding, you know, 49 cent friskies and they were feeding $5 wellness cat cans and they all got recalled. And that's when people started saying, now, wait a minute. I'm spending five bucks a can, but they're telling me that it uses the same ingredient that's used in the 49 cents can. So people started learning about co-packing and how that works. And so then the, the next thing to look at for a pet retailer who actually makes the food. So I feel like I got off track and... My habit of just rambling is comes from my TV media because, you know, they're like, you have three minutes, get everything out you want to say, and then you're done. So that's, that's why I run like this. Sorry. No, you're good. Well, I mean, it's also interesting. And I think um, something that a lot of people really don't ever put any thought into, again, which is why it is so important to create relationships with your independent pet store retailers, because they do put so much thought into it. And uh, hopefully you can create those relationships and trust in in the research and what they're doing. And interestingly, my the, so the day we're recording this, the episode that went live today was with Billy Hochman of Green Juju. And we were talking about HPP and um, the different kill steps and why, like why we don't necessarily want to be so neurotic about it as pet parents because we can be, but it is important to know what's going on because there aren't a lot of industry standards where like they're saying, you know, yes, they're free stride foods. They are doing HPP, but it's less than two minutes. So we're not getting the heat. We're not getting like, there's, there's a lot of differentiating factors, not just with the quality of the food, but the fact that they're doing it for less than two minutes, whereas another company or even some human food, whatever, may be doing it for like 20 minutes, you know? So that's a, that's a big difference in what's going on with that food under pressure for two minutes versus 20 minutes. So it, it is important that we are a, at least aware of these things so that we start knowing the questions to ask, um, if we do contact a pet food company or we're just talking to an independent 
you know, pet store and, and finding out the more, you know, the more, you know, to ask about, and then you kind of, you can, you can gauge if the person you're talking to knows what they're talking about. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, and co-packing is so, so interesting because everybody does it, right? Like you, you I say everybody does it, but it, most, most companies do it. It's just, it's so expensive to have those machines. And, um, it, for me, it's the white labeling that I, that, that, um, gets people more than, more than anything, because it's, you're literally buying the same product with a different, different label on it. <laughs> um, well, my co-packing story i started with one pet food in my store it was the pet food that i thought was the best in the whole world and um i knew the owner she was a wonderful person very open but she was co-packed at diamond pet foods and diamond pet foods does not have a good reputation and uh, let's face it first of all no manufacturer wants to do a crappy food. I mean, recalls cost money. Having pets not happy about the food, refusing to eat it, throwing up diarrhea. No manufacturer wants that. So Diamond Pet Food never set out to make a bad food. What happened is they became the largest co-packer at the time. And they were running their plants 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And things started falling apart with them. And this brand that I loved had one line run through Diamond. And I talked to her and I, I said, you have to leave Diamond because this was back when Diamond had the plant shut down by the FDA. If you ever want to go down a rabbit hole, go to the FDA website, search for Diamond Pet Foods and read some of their inspections. It's horrid. Um, and that's why I don't like Diamond Pet Food. Then not saying they don't make good food because they make a lot of food. You like Costco food comes out of Diamond. You know, Diamond makes a lot of food, but the problem is they're the big boys and they are running max capacity. And if they could figure out how to run 25 hours a day, they would run 25 hours a day, in my opinion, to qualify that. So anyway, I went to her and I said, you got to get away from this. This isn't, this doesn't match your philosophy. There's other co-packers. I, here's a list of them in case you didn't know. And she said, you know what? We are making a move. So bear with me. So she made the move. Everything was great. And then again, watching labels, the batch code changed back to diamond. And I looked at that bag and I called her up. I said, Hey, am I getting some old run or what's going on? And she said, I had to go back to Diamond because they held up me buying my bison meal. So you take somebody that big because Diamond is huge and Diamond makes a phone call to the bison producers. And there's not a whole lot of them making bison pet food meal. And Diamond says, we're not going to buy any more bison from you uh, if you're going to do business with this person at another factory. We want exclusivity. They're diamond. They were given exclusivity. So this pet food said, I, I can't get an ingredient. I have to go back to diamond. So she went back to diamond. Uh, but again, that kind of tells you how the industry can flow and change. You got to keep with your independence, keep watching the labels. And, you know, most people out there, they do want to make a good product. Just things fall through the cracks. And that's what I think happens with Diamond. I had a, a really wonderful person who was a formulator for a big, big national brand. And we were sitting down talking at dinner and he said, I want co-packers to do my food because if I walk in that place and it's dirty, then I'm going to tell them that I'm going to move to another co-packer and they are going to go out of their way to assure that never happens again. So I kind of understood that, you know, he said, I can own my own plant, but then I have my own employees. I got to hire and fire people constantly. If they're not keeping my standards, what I can do with a co-packer is I can list the standards and I can hold them accountable to every one of them. Mm -hmm. And that was 
you know, again, 15 years ago. Well, I talked to him maybe five years ago, and I said, you know, you really changed my thought on co-packers. And he said, yeah, I'm back to doing our own plans because we can't, the co-packers continue to fail, and they just shrug their heads because just like everything else in this world, they can't get employees. They can't get employees that care. They can't get ingredients the way they used to. I mean, the the co-packers are struggling like everybody else. So he said, by taking manufacturing back in, at least I have some control that I did not necessarily have before. So there are two schools of thought on manufacturers, but I'm not, I, I'm, I, I don't care if it's co-packed, if it's in a co-packed in a great place, because a small manufacturer, I mean, if I want to start a pet food tomorrow, I'm going to have to go co-pack. There is no way that I could start out in my own facility. And these companies that have these incredible minds like Green Juju, you know, they they would be stuck if they had to start out completely 100% in their own owned product. So uh, don't be, don't shy away from Copax, but once again, just do your homework, know where it's made and look at the history of that plant. Oh, yeah. Well, and again, that's why one of the things I I like about social media is for the companies that want to, they can be very transparent and show you exactly what's going on. And you don't, you know, it takes a lot of the guesswork out <laughs> of what we, of what we're doing, what we have to do. Um, but so you've mentioned a couple of times, and I think it's a really excellent idea to save your labels. And would that be like your number one recommendation to pet parents out there to save save your labels and just keep tabs for yourself on what may be changing in the food that you're buying? So, uh, be the best you can afford. Find a micro-independent store that vibes with you. And... Keep track of your labels. And then my pet peeve, if you will, I hate pet food bins. Stop dumping your food in a pet food bin. It's really bad on the food. So the manufacturers go through a lot of research to get the right bag. If you open up a bag of from pet food, it's kind of got a foil inside of it. It's because they use a certain type of fat that needs that packaging. You open up Holistic Select, it's in a paper lined bag with like a waxy liner. Once again, it's because they want to control those fats because the fats are what's going to oxidize. They're going to oxidize if they're not in the right packaging. One of the biggest myths, and I, I'm kind of going off on a branch, but I'll stay with it. Don't worry. Is foods are not vacuum sealed when we're talking kibble. They're not vacuum sealed and they're not nitrogen filled. All pet food kibble that is shipped across the U.S. is in a bag that breathes because otherwise the bags would explode in the back of the semi trucks. So as the semi trucks go through different elevations and so on and so forth, the pressures change and literally the bag would blow. So all of these bags breathe air. And again, that bag helps regulate how much air is coming in and out of there. And it also helps to deal with the air and the fats and how it's working. So I can't stand when I see people dump pet food in pet food bins because number one, they're usually plastic. So that fat that we talk about and all kibble is sprayed with the fat at the end is going to get onto that plastic. And then that bag's gone. Well, you still have fats on the side of that container because nobody washes their pet food bin. You dump the next bag in there. You dump the next bag. All of a sudden, back when I had a retail store, of course, people would come in and go, you know what? My dog just stopped eating. Well, are you in a pet food bin? What's happened is those fats have started to go rancid. They may not go completely rancid, but it changes the flavor. And our dogs with their high scent, the dogs can sense it. And they're like, yeah, something's wrong here. And that's why they stopped eating it. So usually I say, throw your pet food bin away and then try 
the brand again, see if you don't have success. If you want to use a pet food bin, keep it in the original bag, drop the entire bag into the pet food container. That gives you your label and it gives you your batch code in case there is a recall or a problem or your dog gets sick. You know, if your dog gets sick, you should have that label and you should call the company. I don't care if your dog just pukes once. The company will track all of that by batch. So if you decide not to call in, and so does your neighbor and your neighbor and your neighbor, the company doesn't realize it's got an issue. So keep that batch, report problems to the manufacturer, get rid of the pet food bin. And yeah, I think that is my top things that I say. So would you recommend not only reporting to the manufacturer, but also reporting to the FDA? The FDA now, you can do that easily through the website. There is a portal for pet owners now. So yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. I think it's more important that the manufacturers know. And again, we go back to the way things are nowadays, there's nobody answering that phone saying, oh, hey, we're going to throw this note away. You know, I mean, there's a lot of shady things out there in the pet food world, but it's not at that consumer level. Those people answering the phones are pet lovers. They want to know. They're going to record. Um, one of my greatest achievements through my lifetime is I have some whistleblowers that talk to me that um, that I love. They're friends of mine that we've become friends and they work for companies and they tell me, you know, this is what's going on. And it's not the front office problems. It's usually the back office. It's usually manufacturing and shortcuts there. Um, but so I think the manufacturer will keep better track of it. And they also have access to the badge. FDA is not going to do anything with one report. Uh, they might with several. But most manufacturers that I know even with one report, they'll pull the sample that they have because every manufacturer keeps a sample vault and they'll run a quick analysis on that to make sure that it does meet specifications. Okay. Those are all really, really great tips. I appreciate it. Especially, you know, as consumers, we just can get so bogged down with everything we're supposed to be doing, right? We just get so overwhelmed and I appreciate you breaking it down into some really, really simple, like no matter what kind of food you're feeding things that we, we can be doing to keep track of it, um, of what's going on. And I also, just to throw it out there, I keep, I keep a journal, um, a calendar of every day, like what's going on with my dog, what they ate that day. If, you know, her poop wasn't right, what supplement she got that day, that kind of thing. So you can always look back on that as well. Of course, that's not going to have batch numbers and things, but um, it kind of helps me know like, oh, Tuesday, she got sick. What did she eat Saturday, Sunday, Monday? Like what, what's going on? Did I change a supplement? Did this, you know, different things like that. So um, that could be beneficial. And if you keep your calendars, you can kind of just paperclip your your um, uh, labels from your bed <laughs> in there and just keep it all in one place uh, because I'm an organized freak. But uh, I really, really appreciate it. And I feel like you probably have so much more that you could say about pet food manufacturing. But um, I want to also be aware of your time and, and appreciate that the information that you have given us. And I really look forward if you're, if guys, that are listening. If you um, don't follow BC or his wife, Kat, they are building out the Ninja Groomer now and uh, follow along with that on Instagram or Facebook, wherever you happen to be. Because first of all, these two are just like couple goals. <laughs> so please follow along with them for that. But um, it's really, really cute, really fun. Uh, to watch and and see what's going on. And I appreciate all the work that you have done and that you continue to do in the pet pet space. So thank you very much, PC. No, thank you for having me on. I, I love doing these. And uh, I've been kind of removed a little bit uh, since selling the store. So 
I was actually on a podcast a couple of days ago with an independent pet store deal. Um, got another one in the future. You know, I, I enjoy it. This is my passion. Just because I sold my store doesn't mean that I don't have that same passion and I don't keep my ear to the ground. Um, I did want to mention just shameless plug, if you will. Yep. I'm sure you already have, but Susan Thixton puts out a list. Um, I think, I mean, it's less than 20 bucks. I'm pretty sure. Uh, this is the time that she releases the list. So if you want a shortcut, not only you can look at the brands, but she does really good at breaking down exactly what she's looking at. So it will teach you to be a better pet food and get investigator. I love Susan Thixton. I think she was groundbreaking on a lot that she does. And, you know, she held my hand through AFCO and I mean, when I first started going to AFCO with her, I thought she was a little crazy. After my first session at AFCO, I was like, holy cow, this is horrible. I mean, I could not believe how bad the ingredient side of AFCO really is. I, I'll tell you, manufacturers want to get your dog to eat any waste product they can come up with. I mean, it, it's horrible. So... You know, keep following people like you, people like Susan Thixton, you know, Rodney and Karen Becker and all of those. And, yeah, you can always look for uh, Ninja Grimmer. Uh, you'll find Kathy and, and you can always find me off of her stuff. We we are all public, public people. So uh, I'll talk to anybody anytime, as you can guess. And, again, thank you so much. And uh, if you ever need me again, don't hesitate. Yeah, actually, really quickly. I, I I hope this isn't like a, a matrix glitch, glitch, but I feel like I remember maybe 15-ish years ago, 12, 15 years ago, did, didn't did Blue Buffalo have an issue with they were labeling bison but using water buffalo or something like that? Well, and that's actually, again, AFCO allows them to do that. The okay. whole buffalo bison thing is a nightmare. Is and, it? Uh, yeah, it when I was going to AFCO, I actually was in a committee because one of my friends who's a manufacturer uses a whole lot of buffalo and it's water buffalo. And you know, he if you sit down with him, he'll explain to you exactly what where what he's doing, why he's doing it. But it is a very confusing. But yeah, um it actually Taste of the Wild was got into a lot of trouble on that too. They were labeling, they had the pictures on Taste of the Wild and then Blue Buffalo has run through. They actually built a plant here in Indiana. But again, another brand that, you know, had a ton of potential and then got sold and sold and sold. And unfortunately it, it doesn't quite, it's still a good label. I mean, if you look at it, but there's just a lot behind it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was, I was wondering about it because I mentioned that to somebody the other day and they were like, didn't know what I was talking about. And I'm like, am I glitching? <laughs> no, no, you are absolutely right. <laughs> well, um, again, BC, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I, I don't recall who was who, but just for the record, I am team bread tie. <laughs> oh, you mean team bread tie of throwing it in the dumpster. <laughs> Let cat now. <laughs> he, she's actually standing right in front of me doing a little happy, <laughs> which is not. I'm going to now have to undo something. To, <laughs> but yeah, no. I the other day I pulled out a loaf of bread and I was like, "This is ridiculous! I can't believe in this day and age I have to deal with this." So, but yeah, uh, she's happy to hear it. Let me tell you. All right, you guys have a good night, and I will. Um... Hopefully talk to y'all soon. Anytime. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, BC. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, 
The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, 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 oh.